thank you. Thank you so much for the introduction. And first of all, I have to start by apologizing. We don't have a single animated GIF in our presentation. And to the best of my knowledge, we don't have a single XKCD. XKCD. Exactly that thing. So I apologize for that. Furthermore, I will not say security is a process once in my presentation. Uh, so the reason why we talk about security in Estonia is frankly that Estonia sees that as a recognized necessity as a digital society, we simply don't have a way back to a paper-based bureaucracy. To be frank, we can't afford it. As much as a large Weberian classical impersonal bureaucracy would be an ideal, it's goddamn expensive. So the Estonian ID system the Estonian ecosystem is hugely digital. For example, about 400 million digital signatures have been given since the ID card. So this little guy that has both authentication and digital signature uh, possibilities was first issued in 2002. 95% of taxis are declared online, which is very convenient and takes reasonably short amount of time. Only 2% of medical prescriptions are still written on paper. And most importantly, and this started for the municipal elections uh, an hour, no, two hours ago now, this morning, a third of votes have, were cast online in the last two rounds of elections. And I voting, voting on the internet, has been possible for nine rounds of elections in total. So all in all, it's an ecosystem where whilst we have paper backups, we have paper reverts for almost anything, except ironically for the publication of legislation. Uh, we, as a society, have made a very conscious decision to be a digital one and recognize the security risks that come inherent in it. One of the fundamental foundations of it is the ID card. It's a chip and pin solution that easier access to your personal data file, both with the government and also with a large variety of private service providers and vendors. It, is, it carries the certificate for authentication and it does carry the certificate for digital signature and is compulsory for all residents and citizens of Estonia as well as what we call e-residents, people who have this government-backed digi secure digital psych, uh, identity of Estonia whilst not actually being legal entities of Estonia to be able to do business in Estonia. As additional secure digital identity tokens that feed from this but don't necessarily, are not necessarily in a live connection with this, there's a SIM card based crypto token, the mobile ID, which is convenient when you don't want to have the card reader around. The digital ID, which is an additional possibility for those who don't want to always put their ID card into a reader, but for example, doctors who need, an ID, who need their identity in the reader at all times. Uh, the e residency card I mentioned and as a newer project also, diplomats get their diplomatic ID on the same framework. So, uh, so we started the ID cards all by our own, but uh, by now Europe has uh, developed and there is pan-European regulation and system on how the identification and signatures on the European level should work. And Estonia is part of this with both mobile ID and ID card. The EIDAS regulation, what it mostly does, it creates mutual trusts between the countries, trust service providers, and the devices or solutions which are used. Uh, it starts from regulating the lowest possible technological solutions so that if you mark an X on the screen, this is the EIDAS lowest level effectively, and it goes all the way up to the high security level where you must be using certified hardware certified procedures, certified software, and so on and so on. 
so AI does creates trust by uh, also establishing uh, reporting and information sharing requirements between the countries so that if you have a trouble, let's say in Portugal with a trust service provider, then the information about this must be distributed to other member states in Europe so that everybody knows that there is a problem, this affects the public, public uh, usage in such a way and you can take actions as Latvia, Estonia or France. Uh, and Estonia, we are targeting our ID cards, not targeting, but the ID cards and mobile ID, they are on the highest level of AI that's security assessments, and we're very keen on keeping them there, so that we are not doing the things on our own, but we are doing those in the international framework of trust. So, we get to the refrain of security. What could possibly go wrong? Well, let's look at, at the use case of iVoting, which is now happening, as of today, is happening for the ninth time since it was first introduced in 2005, and it's a way of casting votes online through any internet-connected computer using your government-backed uh, uh, secure digital identity. Uh, it's, it's very important that we sort of separate that from other uses of election technologies, such as kiosks, where, you know, I think the past presidential elections in the United States pr uh, prove exactly what can go wrong. Also, such as the IT solutions used by stakeholders in elections, such as national election sports, campaigns, and, and also the political parties and candidates. Again, so the French and the US elections showed exactly what can go wrong in terms of data threat security breaches. And this necessarily relies on the ecosystem. In addition to the identity, it also relies, for example, on the population registry. Unlike most countries in the world, Estonia doesn't have to separately compile its uh, voter rolls, something that Americans struggle with a great deal because it's an automatic, legally mandated lift of data from the population registry two weeks before the elections as the law mandates. And it's also clear that in iVoting we have a trust-based relationship between the voters, so the citizens, and in the case of municipal elections also the legal residents, and the, the government, the voting organizers. It's plateaued at a third of the voters, roughly a third of the voters. When first introduced in 2005, less than 2% of voters took advantage of I voting, whereas in 2014, it was 31% for the European parliamentary elections and 30.5% in 2016 for the parliamentary elections. Um, what academic research shows clearly that I voting, contrary to popular belief, does not actually disadvantage or advantage any party or political group or any demographic. Uh, women, men are equally likely to vote online. Uh, less and more educated people. Even computer literacy is not an issue when it comes to I voting. The only factor that's likely to predict a higher rate of I voting is logistics. If going to the polling station takes more than half an hour back and forth, you're more likely to I vote because of, well, convenience. Um, it's so far been considered secure. We've had no significant incidents that would impact the outcome of voting through the eight election cycles. And it fulfills all the constitutional and security criteria for elections so that the voting, and that's been tested, tested in Supreme Court of Estonia, voting is generally uniform and direct and uh, secret. So, again, what could possibly go wrong? So, as to ensure not just security, but the perception of security in the voting systems, from the first voting that we did electronically, till those ones, till the future ones, we are mandating openness and transparency. Uh, there's way how the electronic voting works, the technical specifications, they are all online, everybody can read, comment, criticize, what not. Uh, the protocols which are used in the system, they are public. The actual source code which is used in systems, this is public. Everybody can go home, push it from GitHub, 
look at it, see if they can find a security problem in this. The procedures are public. We are actually inviting people uh, from the public to come and observe the procedures which are held within uh, the actual e-voting uh, operations. Uh, and we are having workshops where we are explaining to the most paranoid people that we can find from our country how the voting system works in order to give them a chance to test and to criticize the system in order to catch as many security opinions as we ever can. The documents are also available in English. Next slide, please. Uh, so that uh, this is a very brief explanatory scheme how the voting works. Uh, uh, we are trying to mimic, not, not trying, we are mimicking or copying the physical voting scheme by which a person is actually putting an unsigned vote into a signed envelope. Uh, I'm not going to describe this because this is not a place, but if anybody is interested in how uh, Estonia voting technically wo uh, works, then we are inviting you to go to these websites, look at the documents, read them through, understand what is happening there, and if you have any opinion or if you have any critics, uh, criticize, then please let us know. So uh, the point is that we are using publicity and transparency within all the society, both Estonian one and the international one, to have as many eyeballs as possible on the system to create this trust and transparency. And uh, really the system mimics a double envelope system which is used across the world in early voting. It's important to remember that i-voting is just one of the many options available to the Estonian voter to cast their preference. You can early vote also in a polling station. If you're un unable to go to a polling station, you can uh, ask for the ballot box to be delivered to your home so that you can vote. So it's one of the many options, and it's been important in development that this digital solution of i-voting does not come at the cost of other options to vote, but rather is an additional possibility. Uh, one of the ways of also mitigating risks is that Estonia owns the software. It is developed by a private vendor, a vendor that comes through a competitive procurement process, but the code base is separate from their commercial products. And that also means that whenever these friendly or unfriendly eyes who look at the code come up with possible issues, problems, even if it's just you know, a message that's being displayed being unclear in its language, Estonia, because it owns the software and the solutions, is capable of being very agile and in responding and making improvements. Uh, this time around, for the first time ever, mostly because I got really scared sitting in a room full of technology experts, we went beyond a technical risk assessment. We went beyond what we're used to doing and what we know how to mitigate or how to address. We took a more com comprehensive approach to risk management and included the hybrid and communication threats as well as management risks look at, looked at that. The, so the technical risks are the one we can most easily map inside of our systems and know how to be ready for them. The hybrid threats, including the communication risks, are the ones that we know are coming. It should be a planning assumption that uh, this guy knows how he's running his country. Uh, it should be a planning assumption that the adversary is opportunistic and nimble and reactive in trying to discredit any Western liberal democracy, and we've seen that in two sets of presidential elections. So why wouldn't they this time around? It also means that there's a large number of risks that are outside of the scope of the technology owner or the election organizer that need to be addressed, working with cyber hygiene, working with campaigns and, and their environments. Fortunately also Vladimir Vladimirovich gave Estonia a good lesson in doing so already a decade ago and has not yet billed us for that exercise. But we've learned through the attacks of 2007 and through history of digital Estonia that we need to address and assess risks in a public way so that we have the credibility to also solve them. And the second risk family is on top of the technical risks are those of management risks because 
The Electoral Commission owns elections. We provide part of the hosting service. There's the developers, there's the ID card, the private vend uh, vendor of some of the ID card services. It's a multiple system. Again, for those stakeholders to take each other seriously, risks have to be managed publicly and in an open, transparent way. So for all of this, it's clear that there's one unique life dependency that we cannot get rid of, and that is the secure digital identity of iVoting. So I return to my phrase, what could possibly go wrong? And the single life dependency that we have actually this time came up. We can't say that it actually realized, because realizing means that we should have the ID cards which are actually breakable, but it actually caused the biggest concern. Uh, there is a firmware error uh, in half of the chip cards which are used by the Estonians. Uh, technologi technologically speaking, the uh, keys, crypto keys on the chip themselves are weak. Weak in the sense that they can't be broken uh, just with a snap of a hand, but they are weaker than they should be, and breaking the security of the ID card uh, requires less resources than it should. That there is a theoretical limit how strong a card should be, and we understand that the cards that we're having are actually weaker than this. So nothing is really broken yet. No broken ID card within the lab or within the citizens has been seen, so it is just a vulnerability yet. And therefore, we are also not declaring this an, as an incident in the EIDS framework. But still, uh, as we saw from the uh, morning keynote, we are secure, we think, for now, for those elections. But we are not secure for the future. Therefore, we are taking steps to mitigate this in the future. Uh, again, uh, there is investigation going on, uh, how to fix this, what to do, what uh, effectively, the fix itself is simple, but uh, all the regulations so around the making is a bit more complicated. Uh, the solution that we are having is that we are going to actually flip a switch on the card, which is telling it to behave a bit differently. Uh, we are updating the software, which is around the ecosystem. Uh, we are doing it remotely, so the citizens don't need to do uh, to physically go to the uh, offices or change the cards, so it is just a remote update, but it will happen after the elections. So, no, this is, look, taking a helicopter view, what this really is, a theoretical, mathematical, theoretical, cryptographical vulnerability. Uh, and that's two steps down the supply chain from us. It's in the firmware of a chip, that's provided by a vendor to the vendor of the ID card, and that's you know, embedded onto the chip, something we can't do anything about. There's an operating system which comes from another vendor onto the card from the third vendor being procured by the Estonian police and border guard board. Congratulations. All we own on here in terms of being able to quickly change it is the uh, card application itself. And the solution is to bypass the flaw through changing the card application. The reason why Estonia didn't put a stamp on it and then sit on it think, hoping it would go away like a frog in slowly boiling water is that that frankly just makes us really stupid. Uh, first of all, the impact is three quarters of a million cards, which is 55% of those cards currently in circulation, currently valid. Uh, the power users are likely to have alternative solutions such as the mobile ID. There's about 10% of all users actively using the mobile ID. So the impact is limited. The likelihood of this vulnerability materializing is low, but the impact in terms of number of citizens is too high to be quiet for us. Uh, secondly, Yes, it is just another software upgrade and your phone gets one every week. But the only way as a government, as a government agency, as a major digital provider of the ecosystem, we cannot assure credibility for us if we don't talk about our problems. If everything is, no, if everything's made off to be good and well and there's no problems, 
then two things happen. First of all, you look like a moron. And second of all, you're not credible to your expert partners because they know that flaws happen. And your target audience, your users, have this illusion of 100% security of 100% of the time and therefore have unrealistic expectations of you. Uh, we knew that once we had a fix, we needed all users who have the impacted ID cards issued since October 2014 to go and download the new card application. And that's also why we went public, to tell them once there is this uh, fix, go and, uh, go and download it as quickly as you can. During this, you know, the Prime Minister, the Minister of Economic Affairs and Communication, as well as our Director General and the Director General of the Police and Border Guard Board all sat at the same table announcing this. And they did so so that we avoided this tsunami wave of reactions of crisis communication when another politician wants to add some of their own thoughts. Put them at the same table, coordinate their thoughts. And that provided a united front to critics so that we could focus on really taking care of the issue rather than answering questions of limited applicability but a high voice. And all in all, that meant that we managed to show that, no, this is another logical step. This is how the digital society runs. And we didn't run into the illusion of 100% of security, 100% of time, which is just a very quick way to professional suicide. So questions, comments, requests, go right ahead. There's one behind there. Thank you, Janis Irbe, Dati Group, Riga. Uh, I have two questions. One question, num question number one is, um, how did you find out with, about the flaw in the cards? If you can disclose this. Uh, and the uh, second it's one. It's a group of researchers that was working on the crypto used on the firmware that in the you know, best practice of research notified us. That's how we found out and we went public less than a week from notification. But that means you had a good communication channel to receive such information to react to, react to it, right? It's also part of good security practice, yeah? And second question is uh, about the cards procurement process. What were the key features you were looking after and how did you choose the pro uh, vendor for the cards? Uh, so if I may ask one. Uh, so the procurement of identity cards is a pretty complex process because you need to look at the uh, physical card, at the card uh, mm, personalization process, the electronic side, and so on. So it is a complex thing, and there are many requirements. The packs of paper that define the requirements are like high. And the digital side is just one of those. Uh, but um, as to the standards, we're actually going through a new procurement process of new set of electronic cards. And uh, as by now, there are standards which we can adhere to. It just means that we are reflecting to the international standards, both on security and functionality, on the digital side of the cards that we are referring to. So uh, uh, the actual documents of the procurement, I do not think that they are public, but effective, with, with, of course, the security and assurance and certification points are all in there, and they are taken into account. Uh, with regards to the current cards, of course, they were certified. Uh, certif certifying the security of a device is multi-level process. All the components of the card, the chip itself, the firmware, the operating system application, they were all covered by certificates from various mm, European agencies. And the third question, if I may. <laughs> Have you thought about packing more services into the card, like access control, the modern one, not Mayfair, which is flawed, but uh, maybe NFC or some other Conduct less technology? Yes, is the answer. <laughs> Thank you. Up there. Uh, yeah, quick question for me. Um, over the years, how big is the public response on uh, trying to find these vulnerabilities and how do you manage them? How do you process them? Uh, do you have a team? kind of going through all the messages, I don't know, emails or something? So 
And this is where really the strategy of aggressive openness comes in. You know, there's a number of ways in which the comments can come in, from comments on GitHub to the very, very lively Estonian community of less and more friendly hackers, enthusiasts, developers. Because we own it, the, the software also on this side, uh, small issues we've been able to fix as they come in in a sort of quite responsive, agile manner. And in the end, even though it's a, it's a big community, the owner of the product is our colleagues in the agency who are responsible for the ID card. And the second part of your question really addresses the Estonian society and their response. And frankly, this piece of news was, you know, in the news for a couple of days. I had a bit of a follow-up. But the fact that one of our most loved rock stars happened to have a girlfriend who turned out to be married got about 20 times of the media space. So I, I, there's that level of trust. Uh, and that comes from not having had significant incidents through the history. Uh, plus, actually, the issue at hand is technically pretty simple. And I do think that we as a government, as a country, did a good uh, work with explaining it to the public. Pretty much everything, well, everything was disclosed so that there wasn't much like uh, theories, speculations, whatnot, because the public knows what happened. The public knows what the government is going to do. The com commentary is public. And it was also framed in a publicity-friendly way. I mean, no one really wants to know the, you know the long names of the standards, but they need to know that standardization and certification happened. OK, last question. I'll try to have a quick question. Uh, so uh, is Customs and Police Board considering legal action against the vendor for, uh, as I understand, you have been informed by the researchers and the vendor hasn't informed you? And the second one, on the new proc procurement, uh, what are the lessons learned? Uh, like, are you planning to change or include some things on, I don't know, liability, uh, information flow, things like that? Uh, so that it, hmm? it's better. The police and border board are best equipped to answer a question about their internal procedures, but uh, we're definitely writing a lessons learned that can be used. That's, and that, that's, that's, that's one of the things also we know that if you don't take conclusions down, then they're not going to be taken into account. Oh, I will. Oh, I will. Okay, thank you very much for your really open and interesting presentation. And here are some presents for you.